be with you. Welcome to the Dean Show. Now, you're probably wondering, why do I have Ted on my right, Hamza Zorsis on my left? And we're here at Mass ICNA. We have our brother in humanity, and we're going to be talking about some very important topics, purpose of life. We got a person who's really curious about what's the meaning of life, and we're going to be discussing all this and more on this week's episode of the Dean Show. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. Back here on the Dean Show. How are you, Ted? Peace, Amazing. peace, Thank peace. Thank you so much. Peace, my, peace to you, my friend. Thank you. You see, you, you already look, uh, just to give you a little bit of a history, uh, me and Ted, it's been, we met over about a year ago? Uh, you know, actually, the first time we met was about 2006. 2006. The very first time I went to a class with you. Yes, and then somehow we ended up at the mosque. Yeah. Well, we're, years later, I, we wound up at a mosque. We ended up at the mosque. <laughs> you, you got to, you know, you're inquisitive. That's what I like about you. You're, you're open-minded, willing to learn. And we're at the mosque. You met a scholar of Islam, Abdullah Hakim Quick. Abdullah, the Sheikh. Yeah. Yes. We talked Fantastic a little bit. We, we talked a little bit about history, Christianity, and whatnot. And somehow now we're here today at the Mass Ikna with my brother, also Hamza Zorsis. My brother, Humanity Ted, and we're having a nice discussion. <laughs> yes, Alhamdulillah. How you been? Good, bro. Assalamu alaikum. Laikum as as Peace be with you. Laikum Good, Good, Good to see you again. Good to see you. <laughs> good to see Ted, man. Good. First time, you guys, guy. first time you guys are meeting. It's really good to be seen. Yeah, right. I feel honored, sure. I feel honored yeah. to be seen. So, you know, the objective of the Dean Show is to try to, as we have the bumper sticker showing, to help people identify what the purpose of life is. Many people are worshiping money, fame, status. They're blindly walking out there just, you know, um, getting involved in all sorts of things. But Islam, we feel, really uh, gives humanity the solution to all the social problems, fills the heart with that void that is missing. So the Dean Show really, along with clearing many of the misconceptions, a lot of misconceptions about Islam, and Hamza Zors is one of those also who's, on the, who's out there helping, you know, deliver you know, to, to the people the correct information about Islam along with the Dean Show. So now we thought it'd be a good good opportunity where we can kind of come together and answer maybe some questions you might have because you're like, what's that, Curious George, but Curious suppose, Ted? Suppose you remember, Curious you remember, Ted, remember yeah, her, Curious George? He got in a lot of trouble on his Cur way to figuring things out. Curious Ted. Sounds like a lot of my life, really. How did you like that first <laughs> meeting we had at, at with uh, Abdullah King Quick at the mosque? Uh, you know what, that was a fantastic meeting. Um, I have to say it was, I, I kind of left in a, a state of feeling um, at peace with uh, where I had been walking prior to. And uh, I was raised Christian, um, not necessarily on purpose. I think the only reason I really got involved with Christianity is because I had a very, very close friend in the fifth grade who invited me to Sunday school. And my mother said, if you're gonna go to Sunday school, you are going to go to Sunday school. And that became my Sundays. And that was where my experience began to grow in, uh, in Christianity, if you will. And of course, over years, that began to, to, to edify and become a bit of a practice and a philosophy. And, and uh, as I've explained in the past, and, and I'll, I'll try to do my best to do it quickly now, is that questions begin to arise with being within any given discipline. How is a story from 2,000 years ago applicable to my life today? You know, I mean, let's be honest. Uh, a lot of our religious leaders that we admire didn't have to deal with social media. They didn't have to deal, although there may have been the social media of the era was some guy running down the street screaming that that guy just said something and, and now we have a, a riot yeah. on the street. But Can we say that's different. the first question, how does a story 2,000 years ago, can we say how that's your yeah, first question I, applicable I, to today? To me, it's an amazing, an amazing opportunity to look at. I, I have a pretty solid understanding of, of how Christianity came about, how... Christianity was developed as the Western choice uh, along with its scientific derivative. So I don't know as much about Islam. In fact, can I just, I will restate. I know nothing about Islam so much as to say, oh, I don't believe in that. Well, that's not fair. I don't, that's like me saying I don't eat cucumbers and I've never had one before. Okay. I happen to love cucumbers. So it's, an opportunity to, to get to know what exactly is it there. 
Uh, we talk about a purpose of life, and I'm curious to know, what is it that's fundamentally driving this, this group of fantastic people to hang out, for example, just today? Go ahead, take it away. That's a very good question. I had similar questions. I converted to Islam like 12 years ago. I come from a Greek background. I don't know Greek, but although I was going through customs, Chicago airport, and the security, Homeland Security said, hey, you look like Leonidas. <laughs> I said, no, I don't, I don't, I don't. He's far more handsome than me and bigger. Anyway, so I had all these questions as well, right? So it's very hard to sum up, but I think the first question that you asked was, how is it applicable to me? Yeah. Now, when we look at the book, the Quran, which we believe is the word of God, it doesn't start in the beginning and in the end. And there's an Orientalist who translated the Quran. His name was Arbery. And he made a very profound point. He said, the wisdom in the Quran not having a beginning and an end, the wisdom in the Quran being four dimensional is that it's showing us it's come from a being who transcends time from that perspective and has the totality of all knowledge. And that when he's revealed this text, that you don't start in the beginning and the end, but you reflect and you engage with the text and it transcends the 7th century, it transcends the 15th century and it transcends the 21st century and it's applicable, applicable to you now. This is why the Quranic discourse says, do they not reflect upon the Quran, the book, or the locks on their hearts? So the more reflection we do, the more hearts become unlocked to receive the kind of mercy, guidance, love of the divine reality. So the first point of call is that you will understand that the book is timeless is when you start to engage with it. So for example, for example, when I engage with the book, I see an amazing example in chapter 39, verse 29. And this blew me away. It says, consider the condition of two people. One person is a slave to many slave masters and they're all quarreling or the person who's a slave to one. Who is, who's better in condition? And all praise is due to God. Now the way I reflect on that from my personal perspective and many of the ulama, which means scholars reflected on this was, hey, and you will understand this because before we talked about existentialism. Mm -hmm. You're thrown into existence. You didn't choose you're going to be white. You didn't choose you're going to have ginger hair. You didn't choose your DNA. You didn't choose no, your no sense in even being proud of it. You, know? <laughs> you didn't choose your ethnicity. <laughs> and you didn't choose how gorgeous it's going to be, mashallah, tabarakallah. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> that. That beard is very well groomed. It is. I'm going to say, he so looks the, great. So the I'm point sure. is, we had no choice in our social economic circumstances or the context that we were brought up in, right? So we had no choice. Not only this, we didn't have a choice in the kind of system we we're brought up in. You know, L'Oreal because I'm worth it. This kind of individualism, mm -hmm. this materialism. So what God is basically saying is, is that you're thrown into existence and you had no choice. Now the question is, are you going to be a slave to that? Sure. Then there's another point. You have your own desires and your own ego and instincts. Are you going to be enslaved to your desires and your ego and your instincts? Or are you going to transcend, transcend that? Are you going to be like a cow grazing and just eating grass and making babies and dying? Is that your existence? So what the Quran is saying is, if you're not enslaved to something, you're always going to be a slave, basically. So the Quran is saying, choose your servitude. You're either a slave to society, a slave to your ego, a slave to your biology, a slave to your context, or you're enslaved, you're in service to the one that created you, and he knows you better than you know yourself, and he loves you more than your mothers love you. This is the summary of what the Quran is trying to say. We're going to take a break with that said, and we'll be right back with more with Ted and Hamza here on the D Show. Don't go anywhere. I want you to imagine you wake up and in front of you are a bunch of guys running around kicking a ball. No goals, no lines, no rules. What would you think? But is that your life? Surely every sport has its goal. Every game has its end. It has its objective. It has its rules. How about life? How about our life? Isn't there a goal to life? Isn't there a purpose, an objective that we have to reach? We think so. The Quran tells us that we exist in order to worship God. And worshiping God means knowing God, as the Quran says. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Worship though is not some narrow, small thing. It's wide, it's vast, it encompasses everything that the human being does. Everything that you do, everything that you think, everything that you feel, 
can be done, thought, said, felt in a way that is either pleasing or displeasing to God. The purpose of life is to try and do everything in a way that God loves and God is pleased with. That is your goal. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. Back here on The Dean Show, we're having an enlightening conversation, sharing. And this is real important that we as human beings, we come yeah. together, we try to understand each other. Especially t today's day and age, you know, you have a lot of misconceptions about Muslims and Islam. But now, when you sit, we've gotten to have some discussions. Now you're getting to have another discussion with, with Hamza Zorsis. And how do you like what he had to say? Hamza presents a, a, a fantastic and eloquent description of, of, of all of this. And we, we spoke earlier, uh, and we did share, we have common interest in existentialism and, and uh, common interest in health. And uh, again, getting back to, I guess, the, the foundation of humanity is that we do share common interests. Uh, I, I've been to so many different um, religious events, and there's a fundamental end to each of these events, and that is, you know, we're, we're looking to live this given opportunity of life in the, the fullest, happiest, loving, sharing possible way. And then they mar it with a series of the, the moral compass that lies within each one of the practices. And so I guess where my fundamental question lies is, and it was a question maybe never asked by Aristotle, if he would have just done us the favor and asked the question to begin with, we'd be a lot happier as a group. And that we don't know why we need a moral compass. So I guess I'm inventing a new moral compass and saying that it's okay for you to have your moral compass. And I want to ask of you the permission for me to obtain my own. And then, again, unlocking, as you said, reflecting, digging inward, reflecting on that. I thought that was a fantastic description of it all, but getting to the point of why we should have this, why we gotta have it. I guess we ask why, I'm like that annoying two-year-old that asks, why, why is this? You give an answer, and they ask, why is this? And they just keep doing it over and over again until the answer is suffice. I'm gonna risk evaluating the entire thing and in the hopes that it's not done in a way that offends anyone. Um, I would equate it to this if we were to sit here, the three of us right now, and envision a perfect circle. While I can envision a perfect circle, if each of us were to grab a pen and draw our circle as an attempt to interpret our visualization of that perfect circle, our physical manifestation of that circle would be probably less than perfect. Sure. We've developed tools to help us create better looking circles, right? And we're getting much better at taking this concept of this perfect world, this, this utopia of loving and sharing and living amongst one another. The ultimate goal of how this all starts is learning how to get along with one another in the world. And I guess if I were to uh, compare it to existing models of technology, software hits the market as a beta version. And after that it gets, you know, it gets purified. We find bugs, we get them out of the way. This doesn't work, we don't need this. This would be really nice, let's add this. And we've been doing this as humanity within every single facet of life since we've been here. We're in beta. Sure. We're, we're, we're improving the existence of life. I guess uh, for me, I can tell you that 10 years ago in a room surrounded by Muslims, I might not have been very comfortable. Chances are I would have been very uncomfortable. Are you comfortable now? Are you kidding me? I'm, I'm like in the, I'm in the bowl of water that I belong. I'm in a, you know. You, you feel like you're where you belong? Always. And okay. this is the problem. If I'm now, this is where the, I guess the, the arrival of my current place in life is, is that I'm, I'm so willing to just let people be happy where they are without interfering and judging them for their current decisions, without judging them for where they are in their beta version of, of materializing the life they want to live that it's easier for me to feel comfortable. You know, I wasn't raised that way. I was raised very deliberately within the realms of it. This is right and this is wrong. 
And as was stated yesterday here during the, the lecture, that what was right and wrong has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. And I'm, I'm not a spring chicken. It's changed even more so in, let's say, the last 40. Mm -hmm. sure. My children do things today that aren't necessarily things that I would have been allowed to do when I was younger. How does, so, that, how does that make you feel? Absolutely amazing. Free, liberated. Um, there's so much less stress being alive. I don't have to run around judging my surroundings, judging the actions of other people. And I know that each of us we naturally begin to evaluate things and we, we begin to weigh them in against our moral compass. A moral compass that's been given to us. Yes. We, we like the color of my hair and where I was born and all of these things that literally just kind of happened on the material side. One would say, and this is why I think that all of us on our path to spirituality, we're, we're beginning to get closer and closer to an answer in that we don't just come from Allah or God or Buddha. We don't come from this definition of an all-knowing being. We are literally pieces of that being that have spread out across the universe in a sort of way and we're beginning to gravitate back to one another. Let, 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 me, let me get his comments on that. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, fascinating. I think for me, going back to my original example of like, you know, we're thrown into existence, we're almost enslaved to our biology, context, sure. society. For me, the way to achieve that liberation that you're actually talking about is actually changing your state of servitude and, and, and slavery, if you like. Like okay. you're basically saying, I'm going to remove the shackles from my own ego and my desires, mm -hmm. no, ma no matter how I couch it intellectually. I'm going to remove those shackles from my ego and my desires, remove the shackles from society, remove the shackles from my kind of social context. And I'm going to try to emancipate and liberate myself. But how do you do this? And there's a clue in the Quran itself. The Quran mentions a word for the soul, it's ruh. And the word ruh shares the same root, Arabic root, as the word raha, which means serenity and liberty. So as if the soul wants to achieve that liberty, right? And the only way from a Quranic paradigm perspective to achieve that liberty is actually changing your servitude from a servitude to your own self, ego, desires, society, materialism, but changing that servitude to the one who created you, the one who knows you better than you know yourself, and as the Prophet Muhammad upon whom BP said, the one who loves you more than your mother does. That is where liberation lies. So in a way, Islam wants to de-individualize you, wants to strip away all these kind of fake notions about yourself. I'm a doctor, I'm this, I'm that. Yeah. Even concepts of gender, right? Because sure, like. these are social constructs, right? So the, Islam takes away this linguistic wrapping. I'm a father, I'm a doctor, I'm a man, I'm, I'm white, I'm black, I'm American, I'm this, I'm that, I have a degree, I have a PhD. Unwrap yourself and what's left? Who are you? Whose are you? For whom are you? And for some of us on a Friday night, where are you, right? Sure. <laughs> so, the, so the point I'm trying to say is, these are the deep existential questions referring to the self, questions that I think Islam answers in a very liberating way. Because if we basically talk about other things, other methods of thinking, realms of existence, I think it has an ephemeral, kind of reality, meaning it's a bit empty, just conceptually for me. Because sure. for me, there's nothing more profound than being in tune, connecting to, worshipping, being in service to the one that created and that knows you better than you know yourself, mm -hmm. right? Like Allah, the deity, God knows Ted better than Ted sure. knows Ted. Right. He knows Hamza better than Hamza knows Hamza. He knows Eddie better than Eddie knows Eddie. And he loves us more than our mothers love us. He's al wudud which means the excessively loving. It's a transcendent type of love. That's why the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace said, that God loves you more than your mothers do. And mother's love from a material perspective, a worldly perspective, is the greatest love. So the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace is saying that God's love is greater, greater than that. And you can't really put it in a test to even understand that. You could have a, some kind of understanding, feeling, but it's transcendent love. So from that perspective, I think that's more grounded, it's more liberating, it's more what I would call emancipating spiritually, do you see? Because I just see that with my life. I came from agnostic tradition. My dad's like a humanist spiritualist, loves Jesus, but doesn't like religion and dogma. So I was brought up in that kind of philosophical yeah, kind I, I of. Know, I know the drill. Exactly. <laughs> that philosophical environment. But then I, I started to realize when I was going to the different realms of thinking or constructs or whatever you want to call it, I really felt that I was so liberated in basically this connection with the Creator. 
because it basically deshackles you from everything else that's in a way illusory. Sure. You know? Well, most of it is, I would think and, most and, scholars agree yeah, that it is illusionary. Exactly. So that's why I think the Islamic paradigm, which we think is not that we have a monopoly on the truth, because a Muslim should never be arrogant, should always be humble. The, you know, the ulama, the scholars say that having knowledge means you say you have no knowledge, right? And it should humble you and realize that God has the picture, we just have the pixel. Sure. God has the picture, we have the pixel, yeah? And that's what humble us. But what we suggest is there are some fundamental truths that are what we call non-negotiable. Like you know you exist is non-negotiable, right? Sure. And uh, you know that, that tolerance and love are good values is non-negotiable. So from this perspective, there are some non-negotiable truths like creator, you're in a state of worship to something, yourself, society, the bling bling, materialism, sure. or your creator. Liberate yourself by worshiping the creator. That's the fundamental reality of Islam. And that's why it's quite liberating from that perspective. Sure. We're going to go ahead and take a break and continue our discussion here on the Dean Show with Hamza and Ted. Don't go anywhere. In the words of Swiss journalist and author Dr. Roger DePasquet, the West, whether Christian or de-Christianized, has never really known Islam. Ever since they watched it appear on the world stage, Christians never cease to insult and slander it in order to find justification for waging war on it. It has been subjected to grotesque distortions, the traces of which is still injure the European mind. Even today, there are many Westerners from whom Islam can be reduced to three ideas, fantasism, fatalism, and polygamy. Of course, there does exist a more cultivated public whose ideas about Islam are less deformed. There are still precious few who know that the word Islam signifies nothing other than submission to God. One symptom of the ignorance is the fact that the imagination of most Europeans, Allah refers to the divinity of the Muslims, not the God of the Christians and Jews. They are all surprised to hear when one takes the trouble to explain things to them that Allah means God and that even Arab Christians know him by no other name. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. And, I, and I'm, I'm leaning towards this, you know, we're, we're material beings, we're spiritual beings having a material experience. Yeah. Oh, you caught, we're still talking, you see, it's very, very, this is the human connection that we're having. And, you know, as Muslims, we share because we care and we're sharing yeah, I agree. and we, we uh, Hamza, uh, you can, if you want to expound on this, it's not our job as Muslims to try to force anything down someone's throat. No, we just want a platform. Yeah. We just want people to consider this. We you've you, you've tried everything else in life. Yeah, we want to talk. The thing is, we want to plant seeds and we want to engage and learn from other people as well. Like even the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, when he came to material scientific stuff, you'll look at the Persians and Romans and say, sure. if it worked for them, it would work for us, which gives us the lesson that scientific knowledge is a human development that we have to engage we have to have cross-civilization, cross-civilizational kind of interdependency. We learn from each other. This is what Islam is all about. Even medieval Baghdad, would you believe it? When the Europeans were drinking each other's blood, for example, we had atheists, Muslims, Christians, and Jews in Baghdad, medieval Baghdad, discussing about man, life, and the universe. Yeah. Yeah. But how can you? How's the fine line, the balance now? Because some people say, okay, well, all roads lead to Rome. So if you take a little bit about uh, Christianity, Buddhism, you know, and I'll make my own moral compass, right? It's like a buffet. What's the fine line now? Does God? Will God accept this? Well, from the Zion perspective, no, because once you understand that there is a creator in in, in life, for life, creator of life, He created you. He created the whole entire cosmos. He announced himself to mankind via the Quran, via the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. Then from that perspective, to have integrity to that message, then you follow that message. Because what you're saying is, this has come from a higher source. Who am I? I'm a speck of dust in this like almost infinite desert. And who am I? I'm nothing. So if I have an actualization and a realization that this is the Creator, He loves us, He gave us a message, He is Ar Rahman, He is the Merciful, and He taught us humanity, the Quran, which is like a love letter to humanity, right? Because in chapter Ar Rahman, chapter the Merciful, He says, He is the Merciful, and He taught the Quran. So the Quran is through His mercy, it's like one love letter to humanity, right? If I know this comes from a transcendent source that has the totality of wisdom and knowledge, and I have nothing, I am nothing, then who am I to say, you know what, I'll take some of that and I'll take something else. I've affirmed its source if, and that's an intellectual thing. That's an yeah. emotional and spiritual thing. If I've affirmed that's the source, then that's it, hats off. I'm following that. 
You know, it's like when you go to school, university, right? Imagine I'm a seven-year-old and I go to a mathematics professor. And he's writing calculus. I'm like, you're so stupid, professor. This is how you do it. And I draw cartoons. Who, who are you going to believe? You may know nothing about calculus. You may know nothing about cartoons. But you're going to believe him because he is the authority. So if God is the authority concerning wisdom, knowledge, etc., spirituality, the moral grounding for our lives, because there are some things that we know are morally true, it's never going to change. If I were to shoot in the head for no reason, I don't care what society says, it's wrong, right? Your bottom line lies to that. There's, there's the segue to, to part of where I'm standing on yes, this, and exactly. that we are agreeing that it all comes from Allah, and for the sake of this conversation, and sure. I'll give that, and, and respectfully so. I find it remarkably difficult to stand in a position where I can make a decision that this yes comes from him and this no. The agreement is that all things come from. Give us, give you giving us something now. You get, this is so good. Okay, come if on. If all things come from Allah, how are we choosing this moral directionality? How are and I'm gonna agree to this. Why would I say committing murder, killing another person? Deep down in the depths of who we are, that violence is derived in an effort to defend a position in our life, not a posture of being a human being, but the position of standing in a belief. This is the conflict that lies amongst religions. Mm -hmm. This is potentially my goal in life is to uh, dissolve that. That needs to stop. So how would you summarize this in a question now? In a question is, I, I, I how are you hot choosing, coming. give it to him. How is it that you're genuinely choosing that this is Allah's message? When we know already within the Quran, and I don't know when I say we, I'm including myself in this because you're sharing it with me. We know that it all comes from him. And if it all comes from him, just like a watch comes to you from a box with all of the parts that it requires to be a watch, humanity has come with all of the parts that it requires to be humanity. But that's the point. So that's it, Allah dropping in on it, right? That's, that's there. Well, that's, 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 it, when I buy a watch, not that I wear one, yeah, me neither. I hate things with me, I just find it very difficult. <laughs> like, say I buy it, let's take the watch and make it to an iPhone or okay. Samsung. Sure, something that whatever. we use today. In that box, you have a manual. Yeah. Now, you could say, let me live my life trial and error. But the problem with this is, not that error is wrong. Because the Prophet Muhammad upon him, he said that the son of Adam sins. And the best of all sinners are those who turn back to God. They repent to God. We just sure. turn back to him. Error is not a problem. But just using that as a method for life, you're always going to fall in some error. So what the manual does is, if you really want to have a holistic understanding of what's going on, just understand the man, you read it. So what God has done, He's sent us life, He's given us life, sure. and He's given us a manual, which we call the Quran. So the question lies, if everything is based on this book, then what good reasons do we have to believe in this book? Let me give you a hypothetical scenario, because we may sure. not have much time to discuss why I think this book is transcendent from the divine. If, and I mean to be very sincere, to look right into your heart, explore and swim into the oceans of your beautiful heart, and I want you to answer this question. If we could show good reasons, intellectually, rationally, spiritually, humanly, whatever, that this book can be attributed to the divine, forget Quran, say book X, say we had book X. Yeah, whatever source it yeah, be. Book X, if we showed good reasons that came from the divine, would you play with the possibility that you would submit your whole life based on this message? Did if you can show that's that a that precise position. That's the precise position that I stand in today. And that there has to be something in continence of us understanding. When I see religion and I face religion like I would my neighbor who was my best friend, my dinner table had a very set, a very specific set of rules. And we ate meals and we lived very happily at our dinner table. And at my friend's house, when I had dinner, the rules were different. Of course. Now, I love my friend growing up. And he loved me. And we're great friends today after many, many, many years. And the rules by which we grew up under we're different. The very same thing I can say with, with Islam, there's, I'm not going to stand here and say that they're wrong. That is a, a, well, that's a given. That's besmirching this we, position. We have to so have conversations right, and, and, and connect the, with one yeah. another. But the question is, would I follow it? Of course. Am I following it? Most likely. If you looked at my day-to-day -day life right now, 
you would probably say, yeah, he's doing it and he doesn't even know. Go be it. Like, I, well, you know, I, I grew it myself, you know, or it grew for itself. I don't know. Well, yet, the funny but, thing about the beard, you don't have to do anything. It's yeah, the easiest thing to do. Just come, don't do nothing. Just be, and there it is. But that, that's the point. So if we're in a very beautiful, critical place where we are sincere and we understand, if book X could be reason to be from the transcendent, the divine, it's a sign to the divine, then we would align our lives towards it. So maybe the next question is, and a very human discussion is, sure. do I, as a Muslim, have good reasons to believe in the Quran? And that would be a profound discussion to have. This is amazing conversation that's happening. We're almost out of time. There's I no mean, people, people are going to, to the else. screens. I mean, we're getting <laughs> uh, 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 some, some great uh, flow of questions going through, back and forth. We're connecting. You guys, I'm sure you want to engage have them engage some more so don't go anywhere we'll be right back with more of this really captivating enlightening conversation between Hamza and Ted here on the Dean Show don't go anywhere please subscribe to the Dean Show follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below please also help support the Dean Show by making a donation in the link below